so hello everybody thank you for joining us today uh, we have the great pleasure of uh, uh, having over Professor Derry Aksarai uh, today. Uh, so Professor Derry Aksarai is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Aerospace Engineering and Mechanics at the University of Minnesota. Uh, before joining UMN, she held a postdoctoral research position at the Massachusetts Int Institute of Technology, MIT, from 2016 to 2017, and at the Boston University from uh, 2014 to 2016. She received her PhD degree from Aerospace Engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology in 2014. Uh, her research interests lie primarily in the areas of control theory, formal methods, and machine learning with application to autonomous systems and aerial robotics. Uh, thank you so much for having us, uh, for being here, and please. Thank you for the kind introduction, and thank you for being here today. This is actually my first in-person seminar after the pandemic, and it's great to be here. So today I'm going to talk about reinforcement learning with temporal logic specifications. So reinforcement learning is a method under machine learning the, to discover optimal behavior by trial and error interactions with the environment. And if you look at a standard picture for reinforcement learning, you will encounter this picture where there is the agent, which is your decision maker, and it chooses an action and performs it and the environment reacts to it as the next state and some reward that is observed in the next state. And reinforcement learning is also used in different domains. For example, you can use in motion planning problems to find desired trajectories to achieve a task, or you can, for example, use reinforcement learning ideas to learn some skills like grasping, walking, or even some strategy used in the games. So the main idea behind the reinforcement learning is the task designer provides the agent with some reward function, which is a scalar function. And just to give you an idea, think about a surveillance task. So I have a drone, and the drone is monitoring this region. And we, are, we want the drone to visit the yellow region as long as possible and avoid the red region. So one way of designing a reward is we can give a positive reward to the yellow region and a negative reward to the red region so that when the drone visits, for example, a state in the yellow region, it gets some positive reinforcement, meaning that in the future it tends to take actions that will take it to the yellow region. And the same thing for the red region. This time it would be a negative reinforcement, so it tends to take actions to avoid that region. And with this reinforcement learning idea, we can try to achieve these surveillance tasks. So the standard formulation in reinforcement learning is, we start with a Markov decision process, and an MDP is a tuple, where there is the set of states. And here you can also see a pictorial representation of an MDP. Let's say we have two states, S0 and S1. Then there is the set of actions. Let's say at each state, we can take move action and the stay action. And then there is the probabilistic transition function. For example, if I take move at S0, I can move to the next state with 0.9 probability, but there is a 0.1 probability that I can stay in my current location. And then there is the reward function that is attached to the states. For example, if the system is at S0, it observes an R0 reward. If it is at S1, it observes an R1 reward. And in these MDPs, when we say a policy, the control policy, that is a mapping from the state space to the action space. So when my agent looks at the pi policy, it actually finds out which action it should take at the current state. And the goal of the reinforcement learning is finding the optimal pi policy that is maximizing the expected sum of rewards. And here, in the infinite sum version, you also see this discount factor. So if my discount factor is 1, then it means that I'm taking into account my current reward and the potential next rewards that I can take in the future. And if you select at 0, then it, could be a, like, it will be a greedy approach. And if you look at the literature, there are various reinforcement learning algorithms. And they can be categorized as value-based. For example, you are maximizing the return at a current state. It could be policy-based. You try to find a policy where your policy will lead to 
at every state you obtain the maximum reward. Or there are model-based approaches. So you learn a model and then you use that virtual model to perform the learning, to find the optimal behavior. And today in my talk, I'm going to focus on a type of learning, a reinforcement learning algorithm, which is called Q-learning. And this is a value-based algorithm and it's model-free. There doesn't exist a model. And you mainly update some Q functions, which would be our value function. And the main idea is, let's say my system is at current state S, and then it takes an action A, and after that it finds itself in the S prime state, which is the next state. And at S prime, it observes a reward, and then it updates this Q function. And if you carefully look at that, the update is mainly a weighted average. So you take into account the previous Q value, and then you also take into account the reward you observed in the S prime state and the potential value file, like potential rewards that you can receive in the future. And again, if you look at the literature, if you have an objective function like this, maximizing the expected sum of rewards, this algorithm has some theoretical guarantees. For example, if you use this update infinitely many times for every potential action, your Q value will converge to the optimal Q values, which will be your Q star. And the optimal policy to maximize this objective function would be selecting the actions that are maximizing your Q star value, the optimal Q functions. But as I said, these type of, um, like the standard reinforcement learning problems are taking into account the static rewards that are defined in your state space. So what if we have more complex tasks? For example, let's say I have a robot and my task is first go to A and then go to B, okay? So in order to make region A desirable, in order to make it to go to region A, I can design a reward. I can put positive rewards to region A and negative rewards to region B. So I can make sure that it goes to region A. But then, whenever region A is visited, there would be some conditional argument. So all of a sudden, I have to change my reward so that I make region B more desirable. So I will make the robot to go to the other region. So as you see, this time the rewards are time varying, and it's very crucial how we design these reward functions. So one main question is how to design rewards to ensure learning of the complex tasks. Another thing is, in the standard formulation, as I said, the agent selects some actions, it interacts with the environment, it observes some rewards, but this action selection, the exploration is arbitrarily action selection. But if you randomly select action, sometimes in real world, some actions might have some catastrophic, like uh, severe consequences. So considering a constraint during the learning process is also crucial. In addition to safety here, I just want to give you an example. So let's say we have some region C. So it is trying to find these maximum reward region, but I also enforce this robot to go to region C periodically. So the question is, how can we ensure constraint satisfaction? It could be a safety constraint or some other mission with which we want the system to achieve during the learning process. So in today's talk, I'm going to talk about reinforcement learning problems where the objectives could be a temporal logic objective which can describe complex mission specifications. Or what if we also have some constraints in the learning process? And again, I'm going to talk about temporal logic constraints. So let's first start with the first part where we consider temporal logic objectives to the RL problem. So temporal logics are specification languages. And if you look at the literature, you are going to see various uh, temporal logics. And one of them is signal temporal logic. And signal temporal logic is a very rich language. And you can explicitly define the physical and temporal parameters. And what I mean by that is this is an STL example. It means that globally or always from time is equal to 0 to 13, I want my signal to be smaller than six. And if you consider this specification, this means that I want my signal to be in the highlighted region 
all the elements of the signal to be smaller than 6. And since this signal overlaps with this highlighted region, we can say that this signal satisfies the specification. We can also create more complex specifications. For example, we, we can use nested operators, and this specification means that there exists a time t between 0 to 12, such that I want my signal to be in a desired region. This time it would be greater than 3.5 and smaller than 4.5 in the following two time steps. And if you carefully look at this signal, indeed there exists a time instant 11 between 0 to 12, such that in the following two time steps, my signal settles in, in between this desired region. So again, this would be a satisfactory case. Or we can define periodic behaviors. In every three time step, I want my signal to visit A and B regions. And if you look at that, this time I have a highlighted region that has a three time step length, but then it is just shifting and you just want to make sure that as it shifts, the signal always goes to A and B within that highlighted region. So one good thing about signal temporal logic is we can say satisfaction violation, this Boolean behavior, but there is also a way of quantifying the degree of satisfaction. So that is measured by robustness degree, and it actually tells us how good a signal satisfies a specification or how bad it violates the specification. So robustness degree of a signal with a T length with respect to phi formula is a scalar value. And then if this value is smaller than zero, it means violation. If it is positive, it means satisfaction. And if it is a high magnitude, like high magnitude of positive value, it means that the signal really satisfies the specification in a very robust way. Even if it is disturbed, it will continue to uh, satisfy the formula. And the same thing for violation. If it's a very large negative value, it means that even under some correction, it's not possible to satisfy the specification. And the way that you compute robustness degrees, you look at the formula, and based on the operators inside of the formula, you use these min and max functions in a recursive manner to come up with an equation for the robustness degree. And just to illustrate it, let's say I have a signal, a trajectory, and the formula is always from zero to seven, I want y to be greater than one. So in a way, I want my signal to be above this dashed line, and this satisfies the specification. But robustness degree for that specification and uh, signal is the closest distance to your boundary. For example, in that case, it will have a positive 0 0.5 robustness degree. And this means that if I perturb this trajectory for 0 0.5, then still the perturbed trajectory will continue satisfying the specification. And let's think about another signal. So this again satisfies the specification, but this is a more robust satisfaction than the other one because this is further away from the boundary. So this has a larger robustness degree. Now, if I change the formula, for example, instead of globally, I use eventually, this time it is sufficient to find at least one time instant where y is greater than one so that I can take a look at the maximum distance to the boundary. So this is the main idea about minimums and maximums, and depending on what operators you see in the formula, you start to use these recursive min and max functions, okay? Now, given that information, Let's say we have an STL objective, which describes a complex mission. And then I let's like formulate a problem, which is like the optimal behavior to robustly satisfy a specification. So again, let's consider an MDP. And this time, in order to ensure the STL satisfaction, we can either try to find a policy that maximizes the probability of satisfying the specification, which is problem one. Or another way of doing that is finding the optimal policy that maximizes the expected robustness degree. As I described in the previous slides, if you increase robustness degree, maximize robustness degree, you ensure the robust satisfaction of the formula. But the problem is that, as I showed you the standard formulation, 
in standard Q learning, the objective is in the form of sum of rewards, meaning that at each time instant, when I go to a next day, I observe a reward. But if you think about temporal logic specifications, for example, eventually go to A, and let's say the robot is moving, and at each time instant, I will not be able to see a reward. I have to wait for some time to make a decision about whether I eventually reached the desired region or not. So if you look at the objective functions in STL objectives, they are not in the form of sum of rewards where a reward is seen at every time instant. So Q learning is not directly applicable for these type of problems because there does not exist a specific reward. Now the other thing is that State history is very important. So let's say I have a task which is like which is trying to be learned by the robot, eventually visit A and then B. So let's say my robot is here, and if A is not visited, then the optimal action selection would be the green arrow, so that it will take me to the green like region A. But if A is visited before, then my optimal action selection would be region B, which would be the following the red arrow. So this means that the optimal action selections may not be the same if the robot is occupying the same state. So somehow we need to track the state history to make sure that what would be the optimal behavior. So in order to address these research challenges, first we are proposing to remodel the system state space so this time, instead of an MDP, we are creating this tau MDP, where this time each state is a partial state trajectory. So it's mainly the current state and tau minus one past states. Illustratively, again, if this is my MDP, where there are these small partitions and you can think about actions in up, diagonal, right, or stay, something like this. So if I'm creating a two MDP, that would be this state, this sigma state, would be mapped to this four state. So I am at sigma one right now, but in the past, like in the last time instant, I could be at sigma four, sigma three, so somehow it differentiates the, my current state and also including the state in the last time instant. And the way that we select tau is, you look at the formula and depending on your formula, you can determine how much time you have to take into account in your tau MDP. And then the proposed approach is, I showed you the robustness degree function. So robustness degree can also be written in that form. It would be maximizing the expectation of some maximum of the smaller robustness degree functions. But I said that since these are not in the sum of reward form, we cannot directly apply the Q learning. But we use the approximation of the max function. This is the smooth approximation of the max function. And in the literature, like book, some X approximation uh, approximates this maximum function with this sum of form. And there is also the approximation performance. So this is an over approximation. But if you select your parameters properly, then your approximation can be very close to the real maximum. So what we are doing is, instead of these maximum function, we approximate it, and all of a sudden now we have a formulation where we are maximizing the sum of something. And then in that form, this inside part would be your immediate reward. So at each time instant, now you can evaluate a reward function, and then like this could be, uh, this could be solved with a Q-learning algorithm. And in terms of technical analysis, I, I'll just show you some of our results. So the original problem has an objective function with these recursive min and max. And I said that we are doing a approximation, the proposed approximation. So we are creating these approximate problem, okay? And in that approximate problem, we can show that Q learning can be used because that is in the standard form, which is the sum of some reward form. And if we use Q-learning, we know that from the existing literature, we can find the optimal policy of the approximate problem. Then the question is, how, like how close is my optimal policy for the approximate problem to the optimal policy of the original problem? So we also have this bound 
So this one is the optimal policy of the approximate problem. And again, if you select the parameters properly, then the one that you find in the approximate formulation can be arbitrarily close to the original formulation so that it could be used in the actual problem. And we have some simulation results. So think about a discrete space where the agent can have these nine actions, up, down, right, uh, left, and the diagonal actions. And the specification is periodically visit A and B. And it is like in every two time step, I want to visit A and B in a periodic fashion. And if you look at the formula, since the inner specification has two time steps, like this within time window, then we select the tau as three, which would be my current state and two past states. So we construct the tau MDP, and then we run the Q learning. And after some episodes, for example, after 1700 episodes, we stopped, and this is a sample trajectory from that policy. And as you see, we can obtain this periodic behavior. So this zigzag motion just tells us A and B is visited. And in terms of the outcomes, the expected robustness degree is 0 0.4. And the probability of satisfying this trajectory, the phi formula, is the 0 0.93. So somehow we can show that the STL specifications can be learned with reinforcement learning problem. So here I'm talking about this tau MDP construction which exactly takes into account the old state history for tau step. We also have some recent work about instead of keeping all the tau history, you can create some flags and you can keep only the flag and the current state and you can create a more tractable reinforcement learning. So overall, in the first part, I showed you a reinforcement learning algorithm where your objective is a complex objective, which is a signal temporal logic objective. And then we, I showed that we can actually find control policies for robust satisfaction of complex objectives. Okay? Okay, so now I would like to switch the gears and this time we are going to optimize, like we are trying to learn an objective in the sum of reward form. But what if we have a constraint that has to be satisfied during the learning process, during the exploration? And constraint reinforcement learning is a very active area right now. And there are different techniques that you can adopt. And the idea is during the exploration process, I don't want the system to explore arbitrary actions. So somehow can I limit that and possibly show some guarantees? One way of doing that is user can provide some prior knowledge so it can minimize exploring random actions. Another way is whenever there is a violation, we can penalize it. But in that way, in the beginning of the learning, you will not guarantee constraint satisfaction, but eventually you can learn not to violate your constraint. And there is this control barrier functions which are very frequently used in the control domain. And in learning also, they use control barrier functions to make sure that they create an invariant set. And during the exploration, they make the agent to stay in that invariant set all the time. And there are the theoretical guarantees with this method, but you have to create that invariant set. Mostly like you can create safety specifications with that. And in the AI literature, there is the domain of shielding. So that is mainly blocking the unsafe actions during the learning. And today, the work that I'm going to talk about is closest to the shielding idea, okay? And uh, in our constraint reinforcement learning problem, we are actually motivated by the multi-use of autonomous systems. And what I mean by that is, think about a drone. And this drone, let's say, is a pickup and delivery drone. So no matter what, it has to achieve the pickup and delivery task, okay? So if that is the only goal, we already know some motion planning algorithms, so we can you know, generate the trajectory. But let's say in this environment, there are some regions, such as this purple one, which has high reward. For example, if I take an image from that region for environmental monitoring purposes, it will maximize my situational awareness. So let's say there is some reward region over there. So in the remaining time, as this drone does this pickup and delivery mission, 
can it learn the purple region and try to spend there as much as possible, but in the meantime, guarantee its primary task, which is the pickup and delivery drum. So now let's think about the problem statement. So in this problem statement, again, we are considering an MDP. So we have a Markov decision process with the state space, the action space. This time the probabilistic transitions are not known. So we don't know this distribution. And there will be some rewards. And this reward could be known or unknown. For example, in the example that I showed, this purple region, there exists a reward, but we don't know where it is and how much is that. And we are going to consider a specification, let's say the phi specification. So let's say if I have a trajectory from zero to capital T, then I'm going to define a set of trajectories, which is this S phi set, meaning that that trajectory satisfies my phi formula. And when I say the probability of a trajectory of T length is inside of this S phi is greater than or equal to probability desire. So this is mainly whether my trajectory satisfies the specification or not, okay? And just to remind you, in the classical RL problem, we are trying to find a pi policy that is maximizing the expected sum of rewards. But in the RL under temporal logic constraints, we are going to, constr we are going to consider a phi constraint and a desired probability threshold so that our goal would be finding a pi policy that maximizes the expected sum of reward. But in each episode of the learning, we want to make sure that the trajectory satisfies the phi specification with a probability greater than the PI desired, okay? So here, the main challenges are, how can one define this S phi? As I said, these are not only reaching a destination. For example, there could be conditional relationships. First go to this location, then go to this location. And if you see something, then do another thing. So if you consider these type of specification, the set of trajectories that satisfy that phi formula would be not, like, it would be non-trivial. And then the other question is, how do we calculate the probability of satisfying the trajectory? Like, it's, sorry, probability of satisfying this phi formula by the trajectory. So first, I'm going to talk about how are we going to formalize the S phi set, which is the set of trajectories that satisfy your phi formula. So as I said, there are a lot of temporal logics. The one that I showed you in the first part, signal temporal logic, does not have an automaton representation, but most of the temporal logics have a corresponding automaton representation. And what it is, is it's a graph representing all satisfactory sequences. So just to give you an example, let's say I have a task as visit A, okay? And the way that I can satisfy this task is maybe my drone can start at region A and then the task would be satisfied, which would be the first row. Or the drone can start at D region at the beginning, so not A would be true at T0, but then it moves to A region, and then at T plus one, it observes the A, and then it satisfies the specification. So after that time, it can do anything. Or it can arbitrarily stay outside of A, but whenever it goes to A, it satisfies the specification. So if you think about that, then you can create a bunch of possibilities to satisfy the satisfy this task, like visiting this A region. But instead of creating that table, you can actually create a finite state automaton. And a finite state automaton is, as I said, as a graph. And there is an initial node, which is determined by this incoming arrow. And there are also some nodes which has double circles that are called accepting states. And what we are looking at is starting from an initial node. If you find a path that goes to an accepting state, that would be a satisfactory case. For example, I start from Q0 and then I move to Q1, which would be 
like a path from initial state to an accepting state. And the, my path would be A, so I'm looking at the labels on top of the edges. So that is corresponding to the first row here. Or in the first time step, I could be at not A, and then jump to Q1, it would be A, so that would be a case which is the second row. And you can arbitrarily stay at Q0, and then move to Q1, that would be one of the sequences in your table, okay? So in a way, this encodes all possible satisfactory cases of a formula. And if you look at this graph, this Q0, Q1, they do not have a physical meaning. Here in the finite state automatons, the important thing is the labels on the edges. So when we find the paths, we read the paths according to the labels on the edges, okay? Okay, so when we think about reinforcement learning under temporal logic constraints, we have to keep track of the physical state. We should know where our robot is. We also need to know about how much progress has been done to the constraint satisfaction. So for that reason, we are going to consider the automaton state. But in addition to that, remaining episodes of time is also very important. For example, if you are in the beginning of the learning, and you haven't satisfied the constraint, the agent can spend some time in exploring the actions because there's still sufficient time to achieve the constraint. But if you are close to the end of the episode, then, and if you haven't satisfied the constraint, then you should focus on satisfying your constraint. You shouldn't do exploration. So remaining time would also be very important. So for that reason, we are creating a state space where it keeps the physical state, the task information, and the remaining time. And as I showed you in the previous slides, for all of them, we have a graph representation. For example, for the dynamical system, we are considering a Markov decision process, and there is the graph representation for that. For the task, as I said, there is the finite state automaton corresponding all possible trajectories, so it's like the satisfactions, and this also has a graph. And for the time set, we can create these path graph because we are dealing with a discrete time scenario. And then if you take the Cartesian product of these graphs, you can obtain a time product MDP, where if you look at each state, there is an element from MDP, finite state automaton, and the remaining time. And one thing about time product MDP is the transitions over that. For example, if you see a transition in the time product MDP, it means that there exist transitions in the respective graphs. So you cannot, for example, jump from this state to another state here. There has to be a transition from S1 to S0, Q0 to Q1, and 0 to 1, okay? Okay, so this space includes all necessary information that is needed to check whether my constraint is satisfied and in the meantime I can do learning. And one thing is that if I know all the transition probabilities, the distributions of the, uh, the consequences of the actions, then after creating this time product MDP, this boils down to an MDP problem. So what is happening is that from any initial state, I'm trying to find a policy that is trying to take me to the accepting state. Because I know that if I hit the accepting state, I'm, I'm going to satisfy the constraint. But the problem is that we don't know the transition probabilities. What if there's an uncertainty? So we, have, we don't have that information. Now, if we don't know anything, so we have no idea about the transition probabilities, it's actually not possible to say, at least estimate the constraint satisfaction. So for that reason, we have an assumption about some partial information about the system. We don't know the actual transition probabilities, but what we know is the likely transitions. And what I mean by that is, let's say my system is at S0, and if it takes move action, I know that it can be in S0 and S1, but I don't know with which probability it can be at S0 and S1. What I know is, if I take move action at S0, it moves to S1 with a probability greater than or equal to 0 
So maybe originally going to S1 is 0.9 probability and going to zero, S0 is 0 0.1 probability. But I don't know these actual probabilities. What I know is I can move to S1 with a probability greater than 0 0.7. So this is like some information about the system. And before starting the learning, for example, one can do some empirical, uh, like empirical results and observe, for example, if there is a tendency to go to a specific state under some action so that Epsilon can give you some information about that. Okay, so now we don't know the actual transitions, but we know the likely transitions. So under these likely transitions, we can actually capture at each state, how long does it take to satisfy your constraint? And that can be found over the product MDP. So that would be the MDP space and the finite state automaton states. And it just checks for each node in the product MDP, you calculate the distance to the accepting state. For example, here, you have these accepting states which have zero distance because this means that you satisfy the specification. And this node will have one distance, meaning that in one step it's possible to satisfy the constraint. I will find myself in an accepting state. And if you look at these states, they will have two distance. It means that if I'm at this state, it will take two times step under the likely transitions to satisfy the constraint. So we also project that information to the time product MDP so that we have some knowledge about if I'm at the state, how much time it takes to satisfy the constraint. And then we have a theorem showing that at each state of the time product MDP, what would be the lower bound probability of reaching an accepting state in the following k time steps? So like here, the exact equation is not important, but somehow this is our estimation. So if I'm at this state, and if there are still k times step in the future, this lower bound is mainly telling me the probability of reaching an accepting state under the pi go policy. So pi go policy is the policy that minimizes the distance in the following k times step. And with that information, we are proposing an algorithm which has an offline part and the online part. So it mainly for every action, you find the potential next states. And at each potential next state, you compute that lower bound probability. If your lower bound probability is smaller than the desired threshold, you don't allow that action. You say that that action can cause some uh, severe consequences like constraint violation. So you don't allow that A action. And after you prune the actions, those uh, actions from your action set, then in the prune time product MDP space, you perform Q learning. And then you find optimal policy in the constraint space. And we also have a video uh, for this research. So here, this is my lab, and we have a drone. And this is just a proof of concept. So. As I showed you in the beginning, this is the base and there is the pickup and delivery regions. Here are the no-fly zones and there is this purple region which has a high reward. But in the beginning, the drone does not know about this purple region. And uh, this is not real-time learning. So what, I, what I'm going to show you is the illustrations of the trajectories in the beginning of the learning in the middle of the learning and in the end of the learning, okay? So as you see here, in the first episodes, it does this pickup and delivery mission. So you see this pattern because this is its constraint. So with a very high probability, we wanted to satisfy that specification. But in the meantime, it explores the area. So after we wait for a while, it finds out this purple region. So now like it spends some time over that, but still it continues the exploration. So it's not sure that this is the only reward region. And if we wait sufficiently long, then it realizes that this is the only high reward region. 
so now like he, it has a like better understanding of the environment and you see this pattern so it spans in the it spans a lot of time in the purple region but in the meantime you see the pattern of going to green and blue which is the primary task of the, uh, the like of the dynamical system okay so overall here I showed you a reinforcement learning algorithm where the objective is the sum of reward. And then this time we are having a complex constraint to the learning problem. And I showed you that we can create this time product MDP, which can encode the information of physical state, the automaton state, and the remaining time. And with the lower bound probability we found out we can try to estimate in the following k time steps what would be the probability of satisfying your constraint. You do some pruning, and then in your prune st space, you can do the Q, Q learning. So this can guarantee to find a control policy for maximizing the sum of rewards while satisfying the constraint with a desired probability. Okay? And um, we also have some work where instead of this sum of reward objective, we can replace it with the temporal logic objective. So you can have a temporal logic objective in the learning and temporal logic constraint uh, in the like learning problem. Okay, so overall today I showed you some reinforcement learning problems where the objectives and the constraints can be beyond sum of reward or beyond safety specifications. And I showed you how to formulate these type of problems and obtain a control policy that either ensures the satisfaction of the constraints or that results in the satisfaction of the temporal logic objectives. Okay, so I am just going to stop here and if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. I just wanted to mention, I, I believe I mentioned on the, I may have forgotten to mention this at the beginning of the talk, that this robotic seminar series is sponsored by Lockheed Martin. Mm -hmm. just wanted to shout out. Any questions from the audience? Uh, I have a question. Yes. So, uh, uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh -huh. uh, I have a question on the, uh, on the tau state uh, MDP. Uh -huh. So, uh, if I understand correctly, if the tau increases, the, the, the state will actually increase exponentially. Exactly, yes. So I am considering, is it possible to do it uh, in a hierarchical way? You define different time scale. Uh -huh. uh, in, in, a higher, in a higher level, you define a large scale, large yeah. time scale. Right. And then in the lower level, you define a smaller time scale. Then you can, in, in, then in the high level, the time, then the, the, the time step may be small. And also in the lower level, time step is also Okay. Can you do it this way? I see. I haven't thought about that, like considering different time scales, but you definitely need, if your, for example, specification is in every two time step visiting like some region, this means that I need to know my current state and two past states uh, from the current time. And uh, so one way of doing that is explicitly keeping all the state history, just like in the how MDP case, but in the like uh, hierarchical way, I really haven't thought about it. But we have another way of creating tractable reinforcement learning, where you don't keep the explicit state history, but by looking at the past history, like two time step history, you are updating your flag. For example, if you have visited region A in the last two time step, you have a different flag value and you only keep the flag and the current state. So in such a way, in such a representation, it is becoming independent from the time horizon. So, and for that reason, the state space gets smaller, so you can have a more tractable reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. And, uh, I have another question. So for the first part, you use the temporal logic as the objective. Yes. Uh, so I, I, uh, I won't ask like, a, in this case, the, the objective is given. Uh -huh. So can you also do it in the reverse way? For example, we have some sample trajectory. Uh -huh. We learn the objective. 
Uh-huh. It could be, so that would be something more relevant to inverse reinforcement learning, where you try to understand the reward function. I actually haven't considered inverse reinforcement learning with temporal logics, but yeah, I think that would be a very interesting uh, direction that could be taken. Uh-huh. Yeah. I also have another question uh-huh. um, related to the com- complexity of the problem. So, uh-huh. uh, do you know what is the time complexity of ca- computing the robustness degree? Will be will it be very hard to compute? Oh, the robustness degree. Okay, so the complexity of robustness degree would be depending on the formula, the operators that you see, there would be a bunch of minimum and maximum functions. So on top of my head, I don't know what would be the formal way of saying time complexity, but the length of the formula and the operators inside of that would definitely influence the complexity of finding the robustness degree function. So compared to the typical Q learning problem, will it be very very hard to compute? Oh, okay. So I think those are two different things. I told you are like asking the robustness degree calculation. So in the works that I describe, all of them are Q learning. Yeah. In standard Q learning, you, for example, consider the MDP space, and then you do Q learning over that. But in the one that I mentioned, in the tau MDP case, for example, definitely the increase of tau would increase your state space. So uh, I don't know what would be the exact comparisons between the MDP and the tau MDP space, but there would be exponential growth with the tau selection. Uh, So we have some simulation results that are comparing the regular Q learning and the tau space. But again, that's a bit apples and oranges because in the regular one, you are trying to optimize a function, which is the expected sum of reward. But in the other one, you have this additional uh, complexity in the specification. So yeah, that definitely the complexity will increase. And in terms of tau, there would be an exponential growth. But as I said, in the flag MDP case, uh, we are eliminating the exponential growth with the tau. So this time you are considering the flex space. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Any other questions? We have a bit of time. Just checking to see if there's no online questions. If not, let's thank the speaker one, once more. Thank you. Um, we'd have another robotics seminar uh, next week. Uh, so thank you all for coming, and, and please uh, we continue to, to participate.